So, I'm uh, going to talk about Stephanie Horde and what an extraordinary um, discovery it is. Um, it's an unparalleled discovery. It is the largest collection of treasure from the early Anglo-Saxon period and it involves a uh, unique combination of objects and a very large number of objects, mostly military but some overtly Christian in <coughs> function. These objects, which date between 550 and 650 AD, are almost all of gold or silver, and many are inlaid with uh, garnets. They display highly sophisticated craft work and artistry. However, the collection was very fragmented as it was found. Virtually all of the finds are fittings that were dismantled from larger objects, mostly swords, the apex weapon of the age. Now these characteristics have been apparent uh, ever since the find was made in July 2009, discovered by a metal detectorist near Litchfield, north of Birmingham. And it has uh, captivated scholars and the public alike since it was found. But I'm here today to consider in detail what sort of assemblage it was, how was it brought together, and the big question of why it might have been buried. Now in this lecture I shall present some of the answers that have emerged from the extensive programme of research and conservation that has been carried out under the auspices of Historic England, as well as the joint owners of the hoard, Birmingham and Stoke-on-Trent City Councils. It will give you a foretaste of the final publication that, as Danielle said, is out later this year, which is a book under the Society of Antiquaries imprint and which will also be accompanied by a digital component which will be publicly available online. Please note that what I'm presenting today depends enormously on the work of multiple specialists, over 25 contributors, not least my fellow editors for the book, Tandy Dickinson and Leslie Webster. Now today I shall first set out the essential character of the hoard and its chronology, then I will present the case for what we think the hoard is, viewed in its historical and its archaeological setting. And then finally, the arguments for why it might have been collected together and deposited. The hoard was found on a ridge of land close to the A5 and the modern M6 toll roads, north of Birmingham. The metal detectorist Terry, Terry Herbert spent over a week recovering finds before he reported his incredible discovery to the Portable Antiquities Scheme and thereby professional archaeologists became involved in its recovery. Initially, Staffordshire County Council staff dug a one metre by one metre test pit. This is the, the black dot right at the centre there of that red square over the fine <laughs> site. This was expanded into a full recovery excavation and geophysical survey by Birmingham Archaeology, who conducted further field work in 2010. And then there was a final phase of field work in 2012 by Archaeology Warwickshire, which again recovered a small number of further finds by metal detector survey. So this shows you the 30 metre uh, I think it's the 30 metre contour, which is the ridge of land, this ridge that uh, runs, uh, it, that is above the A5 here, which was the old Roman Watling Street. And the red square is the full limit of the recovery excavation. The grey area is the area, roughly speaking, that was detected by the method. What does the board contain? Knowledge of what the hoard contained has changed significantly following the years of cleaning, conserving and reassembling the objects. From a total of almost 4,600 fragments, nearly 700 objects have been identified. And this was no mean feat as from the very outset the owners 
undertook to display the objects and keep the objects on permanent display in various, uh, various uh, places in the West Midlands. So at times we would find that there were fragments from single objects in more than one place. Whilst the majority of the fragment relationships were identified by 2014, some objects did not fully emerge until later in the, the research project, such as this socketed stand for our great gold cross in the collection. This was brought together from around 70 small fragments of silver king sheet and was totally unrecognisable at the outset. This un example also underlines how the fragility of the silver sheet has caused an inverse relationship between weights and fragment counts in the hoard. The pie charts illustrate. In total, there's four kilograms of gold objects compared to 1.7 kilograms of silver objects, shown here. Um, but the silver accounts for far more than three quarters of the fragment count. Far more of the fragment count, rather, about three quarters. So the silver objects were in a far more fragmentary state. Whilst many of the objects retain garnets or more rarely other inlays, there is very little copper alloy and virtually no iron and only very small vestigial traces of organic materials, including horn, wood, and the remains of wax, glue, and pastes. Though, of course, these would have been essential components of the original objects from which the fittings were removed. The contents of the hoard thus appears highly selective, favouring precious metal. The objects, as we've already said, were all drawn almost entirely from the possessions of men and the apparatus of war, even arguably the Christian objects. The majority of the fittings, 80% by object count, are from weapons. Most come from swords, with only a small number from fighting knives or saxes. Their array of forms and ornament, some quite new, are transforming our understanding of the weapon, its makers and its elite warrior users. On the basis of the minimum number of pommels, 74, and potential combinations of other hilt fittings present, we estimate that something like 100 swords must be represented by a wooden metalwork. With one exception, they appear to be Anglo-Saxon in manufacture. And that exception is uh, Pommel 68 here, which we believe, based on its art, is an import from Scandinavia. Most of the pommels are of cocked hat form, as you can see up here, this is an example. And it's neatly, the, the cocked hat form is neatly illustrated for us by the society's own um, cocked hat at the front here. Um, mainly they fit with uh, Mengin's type Beckham Volstenarum, which is a type of pole that was in use from 570 to 650. A few, a smaller number of the poles are around that form, which is a form of the 7th century in England. From all of the gold and silver hilt collars and hilt rings combined, and the hilt these fittings, these collars and rings fitted at the top and the bottom of the grip, from all of these fittings combined we have a remarkable 50 pairs, showing that swords in the period were clearly um, manufactured from the outset with matching, matching sets. The twisted ring type, which we have here, is interesting as it's uh, identical to the form that we find on the sword from the famous Sutton Do Mound 1 ship burial, uh, which is a grave to which I will return throughout this lecture for its many parallels with objects in the hall. Another type of fitting that we have are, are hilt plates, and we have over 170 hilt plates in the collection. These reinforce the, uh, the twin Sword guards that we find on the typical sword of the period, a larger guard at the junction with the blade and then a smaller guard 
attacked by the pommel. The pommel held, held the uh, tang, was fixed over the tang of the blade which ran through the grip. From the form of the plates and from marks left on them, it has been possible to say where they were fitted on the hilt. So that we know that many of the swords in the collection must originally have had sets of four plates. Um, however, there are, other, there are suggestions that some swords would only have had a pair of plates, one on the lower guard here, one on, and one on the lower part of this guard here, and some swords may only have had a single plate. Unlike the forms discussed so far, the over 100 small mounts from our collection are decidedly less familiar. Many are decorated with a uh, fine filigree uh, scroll work ornament, which I think you can probably just about make out on, on our exemplar here, which I shall come to. And it was only in fact after a trip to the British Museum to see this object, which is known as the Cumberland Hilt, and it's a, um, a sword hilt of preserved horn with, with gold fittings. It was only after a trip to see this object that we were able to uh, find a parallel for, for our many fittings and to see that we had another style of sword hilt represented. Now these small fittings were designed to be inserted into small recesses that were cut into the horn of the grip and the guards and they would have been held in place with nails as you can see on the x-ray of the Cumberland hilt here. It's also important that their association with this sword hilt, this, this Cumberland hilt in the British Museum, shows us that the number of weapons represented by the horde is, very, is, as we've already said, likely to be larger than the minimum 74 surviving homels, hence our proposal of at least 100 swords. Then there are other small mounts from hilts that are new forms or which have a small number of parallels from Europe. They include pairs and sets of animal form, like these, these bird-headed mounts, and also these little birds. You see the, the sharp beak of a bird of prey, and then its, um, its uh, uh, claw foot and leg, and then its tail there. So we have these, these animal um, fittings that are fitted at the top and the bottom of the grip again. And as well as those, we have other fittings that we haven't really seen before, these U-shaped fittings. Um, like the bird with garlic cloisonne ornament and these fitted at the ends of the, of the sword guard like that. Besides these fittings, we um, have a small number of fittings that come from scabbards, but only a very small number and uh, interestingly a much lower proportion compared to the other fittings. We have these pyramid fittings here we have five pairs of pyramid fittings, and you can see this is how they would have been worn on the scabbard. And then we also have one pair of little button fittings, again with inlaid garnet ornament and the filigree collar. And uh, this button fitting fits into this stone bead, which was also recovered um, from, the, from the excavation. There are, in addition, three small gold buckles, or rather, sorry, three small buckles, two in gold, one in silver, uh, which may be from sword harness. But uh, that's a much lower number of buckles than we would have expected from sword harness, given the number of swords represented. Now, in sum, we can, we've been able to establish that the sword fittings reveal an array of styles, such as summarised here and they're best appreciated from the fittings that form sets. And we've been able to identify sets of pommels and collars from their matching ornament in the collection. And these indicate unquestionably that sword hilts were being manufactured with batching suites of fittings. The different styles, I've argued, could reflect the output of different regions or kingdoms. Fittings in gold with filigree wire ornament, as represented here, uh, many of which have animal art designs in a style known as Sarlene Style 2, to which we'll come to later. But uh, at the start, the design has been drawn out for this pommel, and you may be able to make out it's, a, it's actually a quartet of serpents 
that are interlaced together and in the centre they actually form a little cross. And that gives you an uh, idea of the level of the sophistication of the uh, ornament within the filigree. That there are very sophisticated hidden patterns on many of the objects that, that very probably relate to the pre-Christian beliefs of the Anglo-Saxons. Then, as well as this distinctive filigree style, we have examples in garnet cloisonne, such as illustrated by this pommel and this pair of collars, um, which possibly comes from a different region to this filigree style. And then besides these two, we have a third style, we have what we've been calling our Cumberland hilt style, based on our small fittings from grips and guards. Now, the cloisonne style pommels are very interesting to note because their closest parallel from Anglo-Saxon England, their best parallel from Anglo-Saxon England, is the sword from Mound 1 at Sutton Hoo, the ship burial which I referred to earlier. And it's also the case that many of the other pieces of garnet cloisonne in the collection have their best <coughs> parallels within the same royal burial assemblage from Suffolk in East Anglia. Cast work is, is rarer in the collection than objects manufactured from gold sheet, which is the case with the filigree and the cloisonne objects. And completely new is a style of sword fittings in silver with gold mounts, which is illustrated here by Pommel 76, a pair of unique silver guards. Rather than just being plates, these were, these were whole guards made of cast in silver with gold mounts. You can see the gold mount on this side on the pommel. And then there's also a pair of the remains of a pair of hilt collars. And this, this uh, style, another a fourth style, that is uh, neatly reconstructed here to show just how extraordinary and spectacular the original sword hilt of this sword would have appealed. The other thing to note is that uh, this is a unique pommel form. Uh, nowhere in Europe has a parallel for this because of these strange knobs on the shoulders. And these we call uh, ring knobs. They're related to a, a, a custom, a sword ring custom that existed in, in Europe in the period. But uh, our sword pommels have a pair of these knobs and they're unique in that respect of Europe. Now, coming up, the hoard contains the remains of at least one crested helmet besides the weapons, which is similar to examples from Scandinavia and England, most notably again from Sutton Hoo Mound 1, what we've mentioned several times. It was originally largely golden in appearance, however nothing remains of the helmet's original iron cap, which has made reconstruction um, uh, a challenge. The surviving structural parts illustrated here include a two-section helmet crest, as well as a pair of silver gilt cast cheek pieces, both of which are decorated again with complex animal art of sarline style too. Little, little animals that can just about be made out, as well as parts of serpents. And then around the cap, the bottom of the helmet cap, we had a silver band that, that held a uh, silver gilt sheet showing a procession of running or kneeling warriors. Besides uh, those, those solid structural parts. There are many other designs from the helmet that uh, were formed again in silver sheet and that we've reconstructed from well over a thousand fragments. Uh, they include again designs uh, uh, of animals, animal art, but uh, most striking are these, these figural warrior designs which we have. We have a, a, a figure on horseback uh, wielding a spear over arm which can be paralleled by, by the example on the Sutton Hoo helmet. 
And we have fragments of a dancing warrior design, uh, which again has a parallel on the Sutton Booth helmet. And then we also have, uh, we have panels of warrior aristocrats, some face right and some face left. They wear bird-crested helmets, they have armour and, um, and clothing. And he, they marched, on both sides of the helmet, they marched from the front to the back. Hence the reason we, they, they march in different directions when laid like this. It's so that they neatly march from the rear of the helmet to the front. Now, arguably, ours, oh, we going back the wrong way there. Arguably, ours is now the grandest of the known so-called crested helmets. And ours is also unique in actually having had a real crest reconstructed here of horsehair uh, dyed, with re uh, dyed red. And all the other crested helmets from the period just have a solid metal crest. We've concluded, we've concluded that ours helmet was truly fit for a king, in the same way that the uh, Sutton Hoo helmet is from a royal burial. <coughs> there are also over 20 large mounts in the collection forming sets, many heavily inlaid with garments, and uh, many of them probably come from a single workshop. They are so close in their manufacture and high quality production. Some could come from ostentatious military parade here, like uh, the set here that we've reconstructed as fittings for a saddle, as well as having uh, garnet cloisonne decoration. These uh, mounts also have little panels uh, in gold filigree and they hold little designs of serpents. So they quite literally have these little nested vipers ready to strike for the protection of the saddle. We also have a strange set of silver fittings, uh, two of which are shown here, and these we've reconstructed as fittings for a horse's bridle. The eye-shaped mount 567 is interesting to note because it resembles another pair of eye-shaped mounts in garnet cloisonne, but for which we have a quite different interpretation, to which I shall turn on this slide. Most unexpectedly, some of the large mounts reveal Christian treasures created for and by the first or second generation of the early Anglo-Saxon church. And it's important to understand that this is the period in Anglo-Saxon England, it's the 7th century, when the pagan Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were gradually converted to Christianity. An inscribed strip, seen here, has been the subject of much debate. The Latin text on it, inlaid with black and yellow, um, is from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. It is Moses' invocation of God's protection for the Israelites in the wilderness, spoken when the Ark of the Covenant was raised up. Arise, O Lord, and may your enemies be torn apart, and those who hate you flee from your face. Its ferocity endorses the hypothesis that the folded gold strip was possibly the arm of a golden cross that may have been set possibly on a reliquary shrine designed to be carried into battle by a Christian army. Provocatively, one feasible reconstruction for the set of garnet cloisonne mounts, to which I've just referred with the eye-shaped fittings, as well as fittings of strip form, is as fittings for the side of an ark or a half-shaped shrine. Collectively, we have also argued within our forthcoming book that there is nothing to oppose a 7th century date for the inscription. Technically, the strip's flattened and empty gem setting at one end is of closely related manufacture to the settings of the Horde's Great Gold Cross, to which I shall now turn. The Great Cross, folded but reconstructed here to its original 30 centimetre height, could have been both carried in procession 
all placed in a stand on an altar. And remember our gold socketed stand that we showed at the beginning of the talk. Based on the late Roman and early Christian tradition of the crux gamata, the jewelled cross, its gold and blood red garnets would have recalled the cross of victory of the Emperor Constantine. The Anglo-Saxon poem, The Dream of the Rood, also describes just such a vision, illustrating how, for the Anglo-Saxons too, the cross was foremost a talisman of conquest. And I quote from the poem, The portent was all covered with gold, beautiful gems appeared at the corners of the earth, and there were also fired upon the cross beam. The poet of The Dream of the Rood almost certainly had in mind a cross very like ours. On the cross, the red garnet bosses symbolise the five wounds of Christ, with the mound of Golgotha at the base. But this Christian iconography was combined too with Germanic animal art, as on many other objects in the world as we've seen, the art of the pre-Christian age. It shows fluent interlace animal ornament known as, we, as we've already seen as Saline style too. And here, here is the, the drawn out design of that with the animal's head at this end and its long body with one leg and another leg at the front which, which interlaces with its own body and with another creature with, with whom it wrestles. Significantly this animal art motif which is on this, this arm here is, is actually a copy of rim decoration seen on the cups again in the Sutton Hoo Mound 1 ship burial. The famous grave dated to 62640 AD. Therefore the cross and our related inscribed strip, which we've just shown, may be dated to around the mid 7th century. Now the other object shown here is an unparalleled Subconical mount, which had, was topped with this column and then another apical disc. It has animal art that is related to the animal art on the cross, as well as garnet cross on a ornament, and within its scheme are uh, multiple cross patterns. Now, Professor Leslie Webster has drawn attention to this drawing, uh, this illumination rather, in the Codex Amiotinus of the Prophet Ezra, which shows. The, um, the prophet wearing a very, very similar head ornament. And it's been suggested that what this is, is um, an early Christian uh, priest's or bishop's, bishop's head ornament based on the head ornament of the Jewish priests. Now, um, typological analysis, and there's study of style has taken us some way to establishing the character of the horde, but to explain how it came to being and why it was buried, we must first establish when and where its contents were made. Now, the concept of object biography or object life history has been current in archaeology for some time, and it is particularly commended for looking at how hordes form from the production of the objects through their use and reuse to their deposition and eventual discovery. Now the Staffordshire Horde has produced an enormous range of information about its production and early Anglo-Saxon manufacture in general. Most significant for this lecture is the evidence from the filigree and the crozone work. Gold filigree, as we've seen, the decoration of fine wires and granules dominates on 60% of the objects. Much at first glance compares to objects uh, from southern England, including this buckle from Kent. However, atypical details uh, of the filigree in the hall, as well as the forms of the objects, suggests that we may be looking at objects that were manufactured elsewhere in Anglo-Saxon England. And beyond that, it is the case that in the 6th century, Scandinavia already had a tradition of filigree decorated sword hilt furniture like this set here. So it's likely that the, the influence for the Anglo-Saxon um, sword 
fittings of the 7th century was uh, fittings of the 6th century in Scandinavia. The clausole was formed by the inlaying of stones, mainly garnets, into a pre-constructed delicate gold cellwork. Most is geometric in pattern, but there is also animal art patterns, um, like these, these here. And um, the best parallels for many of the designs and the techniques are found in East Anglia. Again, notably amongst, as we've said, the Royal Assemblage from Sutton Hoo. In terms of the distribution of uh, parallels for our, our gold pommels, outside of the hoard, just 15 instances of gold pommels are known, mainly from metal detector finds, which compares with the over 50 examples from the hoard. The distribution of these, the triangles, suggests that the style emanated from Anglian regions, or a region, north of the Thames. Notice the absence from Kent. Possibly we're looking at a style that was focused on the Kingdom of Lindsay, or maybe, perhaps, the powerful Kingdom of Northumbria. This here is the location, rough location of where the Cumberland Hill must have come from. So again, perhaps with the Cumberland Hill style, we may be looking at a northern style. Study of the wear, repair and modification of objects reveals how they were used and their, something of their duration of use. For example, wear patterns on the pommels and the tips of fittings from the hill guards represented here on this schematic, show that wear is most, was heaviest at the ends of the guards, on the tops and the ends of the pommels. And what we've, we've suggested from this is that the majority of the wear that occurs on our sword fittings is the result of the sword being worn, scabbarded at the waist and that it's, it's rubbing against clothing. If, if it was the case that these swords were being constantly drawn and used in warfare, we'd have expected more wear on, on the grip. But it looks like the majority of the time the, the swords were being worn peaceably with and the threat of violence. On the whole, it's been found that the amount of wear on the fittings correlates with their age of the objects, as suggested by their typology and style. Now, it hasn't proved straightforward um, to provide a chronology of the objects in the hoard because of the rarity of the forms and the extraordinary character of the collection generally. We also have an absence of coins from the collection and we don't have any radiocarbon scientific dates either. We've turned, therefore, to looking at the animal art, the decoration on the objects since animal art has long been studied by archaeologists for its development and chronology. We have, uh, as well as the style 2, which I've already mentioned, the style 2 animal art, we have a pair of hilt collars which had the earlier animal art known as style 1. And this was in use in Anglo-Saxon England from the late 5th century up until about 550 AD. Now these collars may therefore be the oldest objects in our collection and uh, very possibly therefore from a, an antique sword or what we might consider an heirloom sword that was already very old when it, when it came into the collection. Sarlene style 2, the, the later animal art, occurs on about 140 objects in the collection. Now my research proposes that we have two forms of animal style to in England and in the hall. And summarised here, we have an early style too, which comprises of these highly abstract zoomorph creatures, little uh, black head surrounds and grey jaws with serpent-like bodies. And then we have a later style too, which is based on the quadruped 
shown in profile. So we only have two legs shown, but we're actually dealing with a four-legged creature. And you can see the dates here. One's earlier, late 6th to, to early 7th, and one is early, early to mid-7th century. So, based on the study of the forms of the objects and this animal style, we suggested four phases of chronology to the metalwork in the collection, which are summarised here. We have a earliest, the earliest is this, there's a small number of silver fittings, from swords that, that were made in the 6th century and that we may consider as heirloom swords. Then the bulk of our collection is gold fittings, the earliest, earliest fittings typified by early style two and in filigree and then we have a, a subsequent um, a, a, a third phase with gold and garnet fittings and then we have a final phase of silver fittings with gold mounts. And our final phase is circa 630 to 660. And it's this final phase of objects, these latest objects, which help us to come to a conclusion about the likely date of burial or depo deposition for the hoard itself. And we've suggested a date of deposition from circa 650 to circa 675. So, what does it mean? I'm aware that I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to have to go through this fairly promptly. Hordes have tended to be interpreted in um, two ways, either as economically valuable materials that were hidden for safekeeping and for some reason were never recovered, or as objects that were committed forever, permanently, for ritual reasons, to engage with the supernatural as gifts to gods, or as accompaniments for the dead. Studies informed by modern archaeological theory suggest, however, that hoarding practices were more complex. The structure and motives behind hoards, a hoard by biography, so to speak, may be best revealed by combining detailed analysis of the finds, which we've just done, with the examination of the context. That is, the structure of the deposit in the ground and the surrounding historical and archaeological landscape. Much has been inferred already from the material character of the hall. And to summarise, in its material, art and symbolism, it belongs to the pinnacle of 7th century masculine warrior society. We're dealing with the warrior elite here and arguably a small contingent of churchmen. It represents, therefore, the powers, secular and spiritual, on which kings depended. Yet, it was in fragments, deliberately dismantled and selected in its context. While the hoardal artefacts can be compared generally to high status finds from elsewhere, from cemeteries and from non-funerary contexts, there is nothing that matches the combination of mass weapon fittings, precious material and fragmentation. We can, we can compare very generally with the war booty weapon sacrifices of Scandinavia, such as the example here from Nudum, but there are important differences. These sacrifices occur in southern Scandinavia and north Germany. They typically comprise whole weapons, mainly spears and shields, not fittings stripped from high status elite weaponry. We can also make very general comparisons with treasure hoards um, of, the, uh, of the late Roman period and the sub Roman period, both in Britain and elsewhere across the rest of Europe. But it's very important to note that as a whole, hordes are very rare in contemporary early Anglo-Saxon England. We have just a handful. I've suggested that the Staffordshire Hoard was buried at some point in the third quarter of the 7th century. At this date, its fine spot lay within Mercia, a border territory. 
the last of the major Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to emerge in its history. And it was not yet the power it would become in the 8th century. According to Bede's ecclesiastical history and the later Historia Britonum, Mercia was born of protracted warfare waged by its pagan king Penda, often in alliance with Welsh kings and mainly against Anglian neighbours to the east, in particular the Kingdom of Northumbria and the Kingdom of East Anglia. This blue line here shows the limit of Anglo-Saxon culture in Britain at the time. On the west side we have the Britons and the Welsh. And there's our fine spot there. The 650s was a particularly turbulent time for the Kingdom of Mercia. It saw the death of Penda in battle in 655 at Windward. His son Pierda was murdered a year later. Another son, Wulfir, was eventually restored to the throne. And he and his brother Ethelred enjoyed long reigns, continuing the expansion of the kingdom. We have, of course, suggested that the objects in the hall were derived primarily from areas controlled by Anglian kings. And we've made notable parallels with East Anglia as well as Northumbria. The, the very regions with which Mercia was at war in the 7th century. It is, however, important to note the very liminal location of the war right at the limit of Anglo Saxon England here. The incidence of Charles Fines. Anglo-Saxon chance finds backs up our, our limited Anglo-Saxon culture, and again the horde here. We have some evidence of Anglo-Saxon settlement in the Mercian region by the late 5th century. And by the 7th century, we have evidence of rich barrow burials to the north of where the horde was found. However, there is very little to suggest that Mercia was manufacturing prestige equipment in the way other kingdoms were in the earlier 7th century, the date of our metalwork. The objects in the hoard, we have concluded, therefore, were brought together, brought into Mercia in some way. I'll skip over that one. It's likely, therefore, as we've already argued, that most of the weaponry in the hoard was probably made in kingdom workshops for circulation amongst leading warrior members of royal retinues. Some of the items, as well, like this possible saddle mount, could have been gifts to kings, and the church equipment could have been made in royal workshops for the, for the first generation of the early Anglo-Saxon church. Given the date range of the objects, the objects could have joined the hall cumulatively and episodically. So not all of the collection is coming together at one time, but as a result of various episodes. But we cannot specify exactly when or how each came to form part of the treasure, nor how they entered mercy. Nevertheless, the multiple recorded conflicts leading up to and beyond the fateful Battle of Windward and the death of Pender in 655 provide us with provocative models for how such material could have entered the Kingdom of Mercia and the West Midlands. Towards the end, the assemblage underwent extensive damage, with fittings systematically and crudely stripped away from the swords and other objects. Much of this was done with knives, used to cut or lever, but smithing tongs were also used to pull off some pommels. And this points to the likelihood that smiths were involved. The experts who would also have had the ability to differentiate the gold and silver from the base gilded materials, but would also have been in circulation and used as sword fittings. 
Possibly the collected bullion was to be recycled into new objects, but if so, the job was left incomplete, as the many garnet inlaid objects show. However, this explanation overlooks the extremely selective character of the objects. They are the supreme symbols, as we've said, of the power of kings. They are not simply a random sample from a royal treasury. The alternative is that the hoard was an ideological act, a way of deactivating the symbolic power of objects. Perhaps the objects of a defeated and humiliated rival army. In addition, there is evidence for the deliberate damage to some objects, illustrated here by, by our pendant cross. Its arm was, was deliberately broken. This is not an accidental break. The arms are a box construction and very strong. Someone deliberately broke the arm of the cross in what we might consider an icon, icon plastic act. Finally, we turn to the context of the burial itself. But sadly, this is where we have the least evidence. Only 13% of the fragments have known locations, and then only to what the one metre grid squares to which they were recorded. Nevertheless, within the centre here, we have a three by four metre area which suggests the focus. In addition, we have 21 soil blocks that were recovered by the metal detectorists. These comprise mainly small silver fragments, but with some gold objects mixed in, that may well represent a sort of a filtrate from the bottom of a pit. We believe that it's likely that the hoard was buried in probably a single pit with all of the objects together, and that its dispersal was the result of the ploughing that happened just beforehand and which revealed it. As we can see, some of the objects were found just at the very surface. There was, in addition, a single fragment uh, recovered during conservation of a textile. And it's possible that this, this, very, this fragment of flax, of linen, represents all that remains of a, a bag that was used to contain our collection. This, is a, this shows here, this is the edge of our ridge of land, and this shows what has ultimately transpired to be a natural feature. There, there was talk of a mound having been at the end here, and it's possible that this, is a, this was a natural mound resulting from, from glaciation, but it may well have, have been a, a low mound at the time, and it may well have had a distinctive vegetation. And our, our hoard was found just there, just at the edge of it. There was, however, no evidence of other Anglo-Saxon activity except uh, for a disc mount from horse harness in the art style of the latest objects in the collection. It was found at, at some distance from the hoard, this is the two fragments here, and because it's copper alloy, we don't believe it's actually part of the original deposit. But what it represents is either another single deposit of an object, or possibly the presence of a horseman at the site and around the date of the deposition, which is tantalizing in terms of whether or not that horseman was, was involved in the de deposit of our of our hoard. The last clues to the hoard's meaning lie in its topographic location. On the one hand, as we've said, it seems peripheral. Environmentally, the area was part of Cannock Chase, and uh, it remained unimproved land up until the 18th, 19th century enclosures. Culturally, as we've seen, the hoard in its wider context is also liminal. It's at the very fringe of early Anglo-Saxon England. Nevertheless, politically, the fine spot is between several small folk territories that became incorporated into the Kingdom of Mercia 
The first was that of the Pence estate. Then we had a royal, we had a royal estate at Wednesfield. Wedner's preserving the name Woden, so it's possible that this also had some pre-Christian religious significance. And then there is the territory of the Tomsate. And the horde seems to have been buried between the two folk territories. But perhaps more within the, the landscape of the Tomsate. This is that the area is also significant as Tamworth becomes a royal, the royal centre of Mercia and Lichfield is where the bishopric is established following conversion. So it seems very likely that we're dealing with the royal heartland of Mercia here, where the horn is buried. Most significantly, perhaps, the site is beside Roman Watling Street, and then we have another Roman road, Rickmill Street, coming along here. Now, although these are Roman roads, they remained in use into the early Anglo-Saxon period, and these would have provided the main routeways into the territory of, of Mercia, from the north, from Northumbria, and Rickmill Street down to the southeast. Thus, the site was eminently accessible, and perhaps if it had been marked by a low natural mound or distinctive vegetation, it was also quite identifiable, perhaps if someone had wished to return to it. Yet it was also liminal, it was out in the landscape, exactly the sort of place that we see in prehistory was used for ritual deposits and in the early medieval period, in the, sorry, in the Middle Ages for assemblies. To conclude, therefore, there are multiple possibilities for exploring and explaining the Staffordshire Hall, as well as many uncertainties. I've uh, been able to give you a glimpse today of the arguments, although I'm fully aware there are many other scenarios uh, that, that can be conjured, and there is plenty of room for further debate. In the end, it is impossible to say exactly why the hoard was treated as it was, exactly who might have owned it, and why it might have been buried. Our leading suggestions are that it was a royal mercy and treasure, possibly derived from captured battle loot that was in transition between decommissioning and recycling. But the completion of this act was arrested for some unknown reason, leading to a final burial. Or that it was the deliberate and permanent removal of royal treasure from circulation for political, superstitious, or religious reasons. Thank you.